A very good afternoon to all of you who are watching. Happy Freedom Day. My name is Lebo Mashile, and I have the pleasure and the honor and the privilege of speaking to the creators of Silverton Siege, a film that has just gone up on Netflix actually today on the 27th of April. Of course, we're commemorating the first national elections in South Africa. Many people uh, are unaware of the story of the Silverton Three. Um, for people who were around at that time, you know, and who were politically aware and conscious, you might know very well who the Silverton Three were. You know, they were a group of MK soldiers who found themselves on a mission that went kind of skew and they took over a bank. And because they weren't looking for money, they were freedom fighters. They weren't interested in robbing the bank they asked as their ultimatum for the immediate release of Nelson Mandela, who had been incarcerated on Robben Island at that time for 17 years. This incident kick-started the international free Nelson Mandela movement, which was a huge part of the 80s in different parts of the world. But of course, I mean, for us who are living in South Africa, many members of the younger generation don't know this story. For many people who are only were able to be exposed to the story via the media of the time, uh, the Silverton Three were framed as bank robbers, were framed as Tsotsis, you know? So for many people in this country, this is a story that is, uh, that has been misinterpreted or that has been forgotten or that completely has not been taught. So it's really exciting to see this being turned into an action thriller, bad ass film that is up now for 190 people to watch on Netflix. I'm so excited to be joined by the director and the producer of the film, Mandra Dube, as well as three of the incredible talents um, that perform in this movie, Stefan Erasmus, Tabor Ametzi, and Michelle Musalakai. Um, welcome to all of you and thank you for joining me today. I, um, what has today been like for you? Like now that the movie has gone live, um, how are you how are you experiencing it what are some of the things that people are saying to you anybody can jump in jeez okay Ta, we'll go <laughs> for it <laughs> i'll go for it uh firstly thank you so much for having us on this uh, like i said i'm such a massive fan of you and i think everyone in the world should be um this this has been a very beautiful day i think what's been enlightening is what you just said now is that a lot of people didn't know about the story so I've got a feeling the Google search history of these incredible three uh, comrades that we, we sort of uh, tried to portray here. I, I, I guess that's gonna increase now and more bandwidth for our stories. What's been interesting is people have gone from saying they're tired of watching movies like this to saying we don't have enough movies like this. Yes. And, and that's Fantastic. I'm so happy. But Manda, you were saying as we were doing the, the technical rehearsal before we went live just now, you know, I said that this is an apartheid movie and you turned yeah, my perception on my head completely. Um, you this this movie is part of a trilogy of movies that you are doing. Uh, to explore South Africa's history. Uh, the first, of course, being Kalushi, the story of Solomon Mashangu, which Tabo also performed beautifully in and which went on to win uh, awards. Um, you have a film about the Ramo uh, Ravonia trial coming up. Um, so this is the second one, The Silverton Siege. What is your, what is your uh, fascination with memory and with history? Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, thanks a lot for having us on this platform. And, um, I, I, my, my approach to filmmaking is about preservation of our heritage and how can we be able to use cinema to be able to, you know, take a loud hailer for folks that have not been given a voice, the, the unsung heroes such as uh, Solomon Masangu and then the Silverton Trio and, you know, the Rivonia trial as well. It's not going to be about, you know, your, your, the likes of Nelson Mandela and so forth. It's going to be about uh, the people that were the voice of them being on trial, you know, Winnie Mandela, you know, uh, 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 I forget the, <laughs> I forget their names now, but um, Albertina Sisulu, Bacalia, yeah, Albertina yeah. Sisulu, who were the ones that were advocating on behalf of the men who were in the dock, right? So for me, it's about uh, how do we take heritage and then and, and celebrate it. And in the case of Silverton Siege and in obviously Rivonia Trial and, and Solomon Masangu Kalushi, the city of Pretoria is a character, right? Yes. 
stories. So they are not stories about apartheid. They are stories about human beings who were traversing through that period. For instance, mm. the Silverton Trio, they, these are lovers. These are people that had children. These are people that had girlfriends. These are people that, you know, uh, had feelings for, for getting up in the morning. Are we going to be successful with this mission or not, you know? So it's really more, for me, what interests you is the, is, is the humanity of, 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 of the trio in, in Silverton Siege. Uh, that's what interested me more than, you know, apartheid is, is long gone and all of that, right? But uh, there are certain remnants of it that are still alive and around, and, and it'll, it'll always be there. It's a memory that's there. So for me, it's about how do we get uh, uh, characters to walk through the space of, 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 uh, of what happened, you know, and, and explore them, you know, and this is a thriller. And, yes. uh, and, and you'll see when you watch the film that you, there, there are characters that you will follow. You'll follow Tabo's character, Calvin, you'll follow Michelle, you'll follow Stefan, you know, and they are all in one location. So even the bank itself is a character, right? So I don't know if that answers your question or did I say a little bit more? No, it does. It's 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 extremely helpful. Um, I I think that oh, I'm sorry. Cannot... So just just, just to oh, add, that I, was, I was labeled that you know if you watch films that are made in Washington D.C., you know they are not about D.C. the city itself. They are about characters that are living in D.C. Enemy of the State, uh, Pelican Brief, uh, All the President's Men. All those are stories that are taking place in the city of Washington D.C. But it's not D.C. itself is not. Uh, uh, you know, the, the way uh, it, it's not the story about DC, but it's about these characters that are in that city. What you said to me when we were doing the technical rehearsal is that we need to get out of the mentality that these stories that are told during this time period are apartheid stories, which was the language that I used. I mean, I think we're going through a kind of renaissance in black filmmaking like globally. People are telling more stories about slavery. People are telling more stories about what has happened to us, you know? And, and I mean, when a, when a new movie about slavery comes out, for example, people are like, oh, another slavery story. You know, similarly, yeah. this film comes out, people are like, oh, another apartheid story. And you shot it down quick. You said, this is a, apartheid is the canvas. Yeah. yeah. This is a story about human beings. Correct. And for me, that's mind blowing because we're at this time in our in our current history, you know, where um, people are experiencing tremendous challenges. It's like, you know, the 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 shininess of our freedom has rubbed, has become a little bit dull and brittle, you know. So to see a story like this um, mm -hmm. and to feel myself injected once again with pride about who we are and where we come from and the price that people had to pay in order for us to be here. You know, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's a time, I didn't expect to be idealistic again about South Africa and our democracy through watching this, but that yeah. is what it's made me feel, you know? Well, I'm happy that it did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm happy. I'm, I'm, we can have a conversation. I want to come over to Stefan and to Tabo now to speak to you about preparing for this role. I mean, it is a, it's a full on action flick and you guys, you take it on. I mean, the three of you between, Nokola Jamini also who plays the third member of the trio who unfortunately couldn't be with us. But I mean, her role is also so incredible because she represents so many women in the revolution and in the armed struggle. So many African women resistance fighters who get erased throughout history. Um, it, it, I mean, it's just, it's beautiful to watch. And you take it on. I mean, you're there with the guns and the muscles and the. How did you, how did you prepare for this? How long did it take um, for you to be able to just physically and mentally, emotionally get ready to play these characters? Maybe let's start um, with I'll, you, Stefan. I, I'll take this one. Thank you, Lebo, for for having us here. Um, it's wonderful to be, um, you know, in the presence of such great people. So uh, in order to prepare for the role, I think one of the things that, that we did was we got a trainer. <laughs> so it was the first time that we actually, I actually experienced the trainer on set and we were training every single day with um, various activities. We were doing uh, push-ups, sit-ups. And then we also trained with Group 73 
um, where we did actual MK soldier training with them, where we went a full day um, through an obstacle course and they took us through uh, not only a physical training, but they took us through some of the tactics that they used, that the MK soldiers would use during that time. So that was, and that was what was wonderful about Mandla as well is that it gave us that space. So it gave us a month to prep for it. And wow. we were there in February and we only started shooting in um, March. And it was just the most wonderful time to be able to sit and explore. We went through weapons training. I mean, shout out to the stunt team as well. We had wonderful stunties who were on, on set with us who just helped us out, Armory as well. And so that really, all that support from each and every department is really what fueled us um, in prepping as well. Well, I, th that's extraordinary. You feel it because from the second that you start watching the film, you literally on the edge of your seat. I mean, the anxiety that I felt going through the emotional journey with each of you was was real, was palpable, including you, Michelle. Your character is so fascinating. I mean, your character turns the idea of, your know, apartheid was very adamant about one to put people into their racial categories and you you know those categories could never be blurred they could never be you know there couldn't be any ambiguity about this but your character comes in and is like and then <laughs> how do you how do you put me in a box in fact i'm gonna jump over and through your boxes please can you talk to us you said during the during the premiere uh in the discussion that followed you said that your experiences as a woman living with albinism has given you a unique lens into uh, the topic of race, you know? So I'd like for you to really elaborate on that and talk to us about um, what playing this character meant for you. Sure, thank you once again, um, just for having us. It's such an honor and such a pleasure. Um, Wow, I um, I mean, I, this character has been many years in the making and and thanks to Uncle Mandla for, you know, uh, seeing it worthy, a story worthy of being told, you know? Um, so it meant everything to me. It meant me needing to go really far back into my own life and, and try and see uh, what about me, Michelle, is similar and, and different to this character, Rachel, in order for me to truly give her as much nuance as possible. Um, and I say this a lot, I think that I, because of how I grew up, um, and I guess to some extent because of the privilege that I have, I judged her and I couldn't understand why she felt like, you know, she she needed to exile some parts of herself in order to, mm -hmm. I don't know, access, you know, have access, you know, just just live authentically, no matter what that means is what I kept say, uh, saying to myself as I was reading through the script. But then I think that kind of hindered me from just seeing her as a human being trying to survive which i think at the at the crux of all these characters is is that just fighting to survive um so it was it was a really difficult journey and i think one that helped me also just become a better person today and just to see people as people and as you were saying um kind of see just how barbaric this like racial categor categorization is you know it's 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 inhumane and it's it's stripped our people of of their dignity and mm. and their families in so many ways you know but um yeah as i'd said at the panel discussion I, I i my experiences just growing up uh in pretoria um i went to grahamstown road so like i've been around south africa and i've seen a lot i've experienced a lot and um i think growing up i was in a, a, a kind of a bubble you know and I think my parents were very intentional about the spaces they put me in because the reality is that a lot of people aren't informed about Altum um, mm. so my mom and my dad wanted to protect me you know and and it worked but they also put me in spaces where people were um, woke you know and, and understood that blackness is complex you know so mm. I never felt different in a negative way I knew I was different but not in, in a negative way um, and and then leaving that that kind of cocoon or that bubble, I started to interact with the world in a more uh, negative way, uh, where my identity was constantly questioned. You know, where people would uh, not even ask, "Hey, are you living with albinism?" Or you know, they'd just tell me, "Oh, you are. You must be Asian, or you must be white, or you know," and and kind of not really 
accept me for being who I am, which is a black woman living with albinism. Um, so I needed to really begin to understand like, okay, I come from this privilege where people just saw me for who I was, but the world doesn't necessarily see that or doesn't understand that or is not informed enough. Some spaces are like that. So it gave me a huge, um, a lot of insight into how we see one another, how we treat one another. Um, I remember speaking to a friend of mine who had walked into a shop and and she, she you know, melanated black woman who walked into a shop and and was followed around the shop because the the lady working there thought that she may steal. And I'm like, wow, I've never experienced that, you know. And and I don't know, mm -hmm. I can't say maybe it's just my life, but the reality is that there are a lot of black people that will experience experience that just based on the color of your skin but my mm -hmm. experience as a black woman in a in this skin is very different and very complex um depending on where i am depending on who i'm speaking to uh but it's definitely given me uh, a lot of insight on 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 what uh, like what work we need to do as people and what work we need to do specifically in south africa the the arc of your character's transformation is so beautiful to watch. I mean, each of you actually, the, you you go through your own individual journeys. As much as there's the the tension of what is happening and the police and the urgency of of the actual you know the standoff, but there's also these very tender, poignant personal journeys that you're going through. Um, I'd like to come to you, Tabo, now because this is the second project that you've done with. Bam uh, Budmandla, well, the second feature film. Um, and I mean, in the first one, you played uh, Kalushi, you played Solomon Mashangu, and now you are playing, you know, one of the, the Silverton Three, one of the Silverton Trio. Um, as an actor, to have had the, the, the experience of embodying these, these stories um, that are pivotal, pivotal lives and events in our history, you know, how has this how has this changed your understanding of our history? Um, thank you for that. I think firstly, uh, working with uh, Mandla Dube has it's been a blessing, not just to me as an artist, but to me as a, as a human being. Uh, he's informed me of so much of our history and then for him to be the author of South African history at this point, because that's what cinema will be. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. long, it's, I, th I honestly think these movies will last longer than the textbooks. Uh, sure. I think film and art yeah. generally outlives literature, sadly, because literature gets burnt, but heart, and like art gets hidden and, and kept. And I think he's, he was such a, a key point in me understanding the world differently. I think this apathy we spoke about, people calling them apartheid films or saying that um, they don't want to see uh, projects like this anymore. Well, how me sort of uh, being part of telling their story has made me militant. I have become militant in telling uh, our stories and, and, and they vary. They can be not just in this era and different eras. But I realized when people say like, hey, you always do apartheid movies, you always do this. And I'm just thinking to myself, wow, we are such a broken people that we are apathetic about the telling of our own story. How sure. could are we, you know? And um, whenever I get asked, why do you always do these things? I'm like, if, if, if myself and my mind and all these people, we don't, who will? Who will, who will capsulate these stories? If, if the poets don't tell the stories, who, who will tell the story of the warrior? You know, and, and I just, I'm, I've become sort of like, um, I don't really care what the audience likes anymore. There's a responsibility that's greater than the audience right now. And that audience will only really appreciate it years later when they realize no one has captured their story. But mm -hmm. I will capture every story of every king, queen, every warrior, of my mother, of my sister, of everybody I can. I have so much story here in South Africa, in Africa to tell. And yes, I, I, Hollywood calls and the, the UK calls and they all call. Those feel like jobs, but this this feels like a legacy. So that's that's mm. kind of how impacted me. You put it so beautifully. Um, it, during the premiere, you also spoke about how Brahmanda's approach to filmmaking is is it incorporates a lot of different artistic elements you spoke about mm. how artistic his uh approach to filmmaking mm -hmm. is like how he creates these exhibitions and then you mm. also spoke about how ritualistic it is how yeah. his approach to history is very much grounded in like you know our sure. understanding of spirituality and memory and ancestry can you talk to us about that maybe you maybe each of you could could share you know how you experience that well, I, I will say this, and he'll, he'll speak on this more. He speaks of voodoo cinema. I, I love when he, he phrases that. 
And I love Buddhist. And Buddhist is essentially just African spiritualism at its core. It's our magic, you know. Um, the, the first thing we did with uh, the, the previous movie we did together with Salun and Matlang was we went Sayopatha. And, re- and then sort of, you know, bowed down with the family and, and requested permission to tell the story. We did the same here. And, I, and to be honest with you, ever since you taught me that, I've been doing it with every sort of character, especially those who are based in reality. Just an wow. asking of permission to, yeah. to tell a story. Um, and look, you, you don't actually ever get an answer back, do you? And uh, I think... yourself enough I think to go down and, I, and then just go to Um Samoe to say hey listen man I, I really want to tell the story because if I get it wrong if I'm not accurate I apologize but this is me honoring you this is my gift and I just want to thank him for connecting us to that spirituality of the, of the world and what we do is so spiritual so, you know Ingo, these Ingo, you know like the art is the song you know so yeah that's that's my, my journey mm. Stefan for you well, I mean, this this was the first time that I ever experienced something of, you know, going to the grave and, and asking for permission. And I think that to me is is so beautiful because you get to one, it, it feels more real at this point. And mm-hmm. again, what, what Mandla was saying about the, the humanity of it all, you realize that these weren't just MK soldiers. These were people with families. These were people who woke up in the morning, who made breakfast, who were worried about bills that needed to be paid. And it, it, it grounds everything for you. And then you realize that, oh, our history has, has been redacted because when doing research for the film as well, it's difficult to find information about the Silverton Trio. They, they, mm. There's not that much out there. And, yeah. and what Mandla did, which was so beautiful, and you spoke about the exhibitions, is that he gave us an exhibition of South African history and of the Silverton Trio. And it became this ritual. We took off our shoes when we entered the space and then you had everything laid out on, the, on this massive banner on the floor and we would go through everything. And, and the way Mandla phrases and then talks about all these little details that, that you know nothing about and then suddenly you're like, oh, you're connecting the dots. And, and that to me is, is such a beautiful part. And I, and I hope that, you know, when someone watches the film as well, that they can see that there has been all this history put into it. There has been this 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 recording of our history, because now, as as Tawa has mentioned, it exists in perpetuity. It will exist forever. This is the record of history now, and people will Google the the Silverton Trio and find out about them and find out what happened at Silverton, and what happened in the bank. And um, I'm I'm very grateful for all of the experience that I've gained from working with these amazing people and and their connectedness to to just telling authentic stories in South Africa. And for you, Michelle, your experience of the of the ritualistic and artistic side of preparing for this film. Yeah, I mean, I think that Tabo and Stefan have put it so beautifully, and. Um, I think that it's 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 a blessing to have a director like Uncle Mandler who um, truly understands how multifaceted storytelling is, especially African storytelling. And there's just so many, it's just so much movement and so much rhythm and there's so much, it's palpable, you know? And, and I think that maybe as a trauma response, sometimes we forget how our stories like are living around us, you know, and 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 as Stefan is saying that these are people who who loved and cried and and were passionate. And I think that through just seeing that and understanding that these are not just random people, these are people who um, were courageous and 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 wanted a better life for their families and for us is mm-hmm. is what allowed us to just even have the most emotional kind of scenes on set you know and 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 when when a scene happened like that it was it was like you know badimu they were in agreement mm-hmm. you could just feel it like it was we did the right thing we prepared for it and that's why we can have such beautiful moments on set and then finally you know give it to the world mm. but mandla please can you talk to us about um 
your own artistic and spiritual philosophy behind filmmaking. Uh, I mean, I, I when a couple of years ago, I did a play about the life of Sarki Bartman and my family went to the Hamptus River Valley to her gravesite. And we did a similar thing, you know, I, I, I asked for permission for, to, pay, to play her and, you know, thanked her for her experience and thanked her ancestors. It's a very private, personal, spiritual uh, ritual, you know, and we're going through the spiritual awakening, I think, as a, as a nation um, where our indigenous belief systems are kind of coming into the fore in a very public way that I, I've, I've not seen that in my lifetime, you know, to see actors speaking about Upasha as part of a preparation for playing a character publicly, you know, is quite radical. Like, can you talk to us about your philosophy, the spirituality of filmmaking and, and, and why you take this approach? Yeah, as Tabo says, I call it voodoo cinema, you know, and for a long time, we obviously, you know, we're not uh, embracing of voodooism because uh, we actually have a song by uh, Fela Kuti in the film. Which, Zombie, uh, I heard it, yes. <laughs> You know, so it's 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 beautiful to be embraced who you are, you know, and uh, that spirituality has given birth to many other forms of uh, of of religions, if you want to call them that, you know, uh, you know. So so the birth of, of 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 humanity comes from here. So I think once you start going to the roots of who you are, you become so free, and you just zen into your full being and you are able to, to realize your potential. We haven't even hit the tip of the iceberg of what we mm. can be able to contribute mm. as African people to humanity. I think the whole world is waiting for us to say, you know, we kind of fucked all of this up. What are we gonna do guys? Can you help us out? <laughs> you know, you, you see what's happening in, 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 in the Ukraine, you know, sure. uh, uh, and you see what's happening, uh, you know, it's it, it just in the universe itself, the self purification that, uh, that's taking place uh, from Mother Earth, you know. So there's a lot that we have to contribute and give to humanity as African people. So voodoo cinema is about going to the roots and just celebrating who we are and, uh, and telling these stories. One of the things that we did we talk, when, uh, with uh, uh, Michelle was talking about albinism and the issue of skin tones. One of the things that we did when having an, an amazing partner like Netflix, we said to them, you know, we want to be able to be intentional about disrupting uh, technology. And we introduced a thing called digital melanin cinematography, which is part of the whole fourth IR or AI, if you want to call it that, where wow. uh, in the past, uh, Kodak uh, and Fuji manufactured film stocks that were on white Caucasian skin tones, right? Mm -hmm. As a standard. So you and I were not a standard. So, so, so what happened is that in the 70s, when they were selling uh, uh, dark uh, uh, wooden furniture and chocolate, but using white Caucasian uh, 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 models, they realized that the chocolate that they were selling, the, the wooden furniture that they were selling didn't come out as prominent, only the white actress who's a model. And then they realized that, damn, there's something wrong with this manufacturing of this film stocks. How do we kind of turn it around, right? And they had to quickly start bringing in what we call the, the low end of the curve from a, from a, from, from a film stock uh, sensitometry, right? It, it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a scientific thing. So we, we then asked uh, um, uh, Netflix that can we be intentional about disrupting the digital technology so that African melanin skin tones can be a standard. Wow. You know? And then they were like, well, where do we start? And all of that is so, well, we start with being black. We start with accepting that black people are a standard. If you go and look at, you know, our ancient paintings in the tombs of, uh, of Egypt and so forth, black people were able to reflect themselves as they are. And then they reflected the entire spectrum of humanity. You know, you had Caucasians, you had, everybody was on what's reflected. There was no such thing as race. So the, the whole uh, 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 character that, uh, that, that Michelle plays, you know, it, disp it, it, it tells you how ridiculous racism is. It's like, it's the most mm. stupidest thing, 
right? So, 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 so we're very thankful to Netflix to having embraced digital men and cinematography that, uh, that uh, we are using as a standard. And hopefully other filmmakers can be able to embrace it. And, uh, and then we just keep uh, growing that, you know, and we are the standard, you know, and we're not saying that other, other skin tones are not the standard, but we just simply say like, let us affirm ourselves, you know, black lives matter, you know, let us, <laughs> let us assert ourselves and, and, and give humanity some, some answers to, to why, uh, you know, uh, they should be able to, to embrace black consciousness, you know? Digital humanity melanin. needs black, humanity needs black consciousness. Like it's, it does. It's so yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Digital melanin cinematography is that the right term? Yeah. Hey, um, wow. Um. Th that's that's another. You've blown my mind again. Uh, but you know, also now that you say it, it's one of the things that the mind is registers without actually being aware of. Because now that I think about it, all of the skin tones were lit beautifully. Everybody read your skin read the way that it actually that it actually is, you know? Black people didn't look like too black or ashy. You know, di you didn't come out looking, you know, sometimes on film or on camera or on TV, you know, you have to wear like a, a thick cake of makeup just to look kind of human. And when you, the way you read on camera is not the way that you read in real life, but there was, there was, the textures of the skin, of the different skin tones from black, from black, black to white, they all read as real. Um, and they read as real in the context, you know? So you could see the beauty of Tabo's beautiful brown skin mm -hmm. when he was sweating, when he was having the asthma attack, as mm -hmm. the day went on and then you, get, you got tired and dirty, but you still look like you. And it's something that you don't, I wasn't conscious of it until you said it, you know, it's deliberate and it's intentional uh -huh. and it shows that we are being centered as human beings, you know, mm -hmm. so you see the full humanity of the person, you don't have to make allowances for it or apologies for it or try to make it make sense somehow or say, oh, that happened because H, the lighting wasn't right. No, this is a human being. That is that's amazing. You know, you know the, the, the proverb that says until the lion can begin to tell his story the hunter will always be glorified is exactly Absolutely. what the man in cinematography and voodoo cinema is. It's like, why aren't we celebrating who we are? You know what I mean? I want to talk to you, but please, uh, so please tell me, why aren't we celebrating who we are? You're a poet. Because we've been, been, because we've been broken, because we, our history has been erased, because we have been colonized, because of apartheid, because of patriarchy, because we also don't honor and celebrate the feminine. You know, if we say black lives matter, we have to say human lives matter. We have to say queer lives matter. We have to say the lives of the dead matter, you know, and in order to do those things, you have to, de you have to completely deconstruct the systems of power and the paradigms that we have gotten used to that we live with, you know? Um, and, and I mean, I think that's that's what you are talking about is, is using art as a tool of, of beauty and memory and all the wonderful things art does, but also using art as a tool of resistance and subversion at the same time you know, without compromising the art because it's still an entertaining ride. Even if I didn't care about South African politics, like this is a, this is a dope action movie, you know? <laughs> it's riveting to watch, you know? Yeah. So like the fact that all of these elements come together so seamlessly, I think is just, is really interesting. Before I leave you, Brahmanda, I want to ask you because people have mentioned this, um, this, this exhibition that you did and how you made people take off their shoes and walk in. Like, how did you do your research? How, how, who did you, who did you speak to? What was the content of that exhibition, you know? And what did that space serve creating, curating that space? What function did it serve for you as a director? Well, research, research, research. I research a lot when I get into telling a story or any film. And uh, this whole journey started while I was lecturing at Vets University. And I wanted to do my second master's on uh, preserving heritage in the convergence of technology, right? We are in the convergence right now. And then, uh, you know, how are we preserving our heritage? So I went to the Department of Arts and Culture's uh, archives 
to look at the Rivonia trial, the trial of Solomon Masangu, the, the Silverton Trio, and uh, having done and worked with uh, Miki Dube on um, uh, Sobu Great Soul. We That's a beautiful find, film as well. Thank you. We yeah. couldn't find any archives, right? So yeah. I said to myself, we have to be very intentional about creating an archive and, and then get these archives and celebrate them. And the Department of Arts and Culture were amazing, you know, in as far as uh, how records are kept. So Imbo, Ngi, you know, Griots are archivists, you know. When I come here and say, Mutu, Betu, Belim, Ten, and Zala, who, Mandaga is so, Zalo, Mashobot, O Zalo, who so to Bo, Zalo, you know, the Unzwagel, and so forth. I, it's a I, I it, it's a it's an archive it's a narrative right. that tells you who I am right uh and so we need to be able to to celebrate even our oral archivists and tell those stories so so that's what I did so then I did the exhibition for 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 myself to be able to uh fuse that narrative into I didn't want to do a documentary but I always knew that I wanted to do a fictionalized uh, 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 inter- adaptation of these stories, but I needed to be able to get as close as I could to the facts, to the truth, and so that you as an audience member can be able to uh, uh, give the story credibility. When you sit in there and watching a film, the closer you are to the facts, to the truth, these characters, you'll be able to believe them. And the magic that, they, that the actors do, I mean, what Tabo, what Stefan and what Knox and uh, and Michelle do and Arnold, I mean, something like Arnold Foslow, you know? Yeah. When you get the facts and the roots of what really happened, they it's a magical thing. You can't explain it. It's it's you know, you 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 tell Arnold this is what's going on, you tell Tabo this is what's going on at the scene and all of that, but you gotta give them time to rehearse. And in South Africa, we have not given our actors time to rehearse. So I had this Ooh. expression. Yeah, they don't re- <laughs> I'm Woo! sorry. We, we, we get, yeah, I know. We I know. the ground know. running because of budgets, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. And, it, it's, it, and yeah. everybody is poorer for it. I mean, you actually, yeah. you feel the level of preparation that you went through in the detail, you know, yeah. from the, the, just the clothing, the cars, that you, yeah. you're transported into the time, you know? Um, yeah. Sorry to cut you off. Please continue. No, it's, 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 it's all good. So we you know, so, so they appreciate that. They literally become the embodiment of these characters that they're walking when they get into set, right? So on set, there's no time to say, how about if you think, they just, they become, they magically become those characters, right? So because we don't have budgets to be trying to figure it out on set. So you figure sure. out, a, a film is made in the prep. You got to make sure that in the prep, it's all done, finished. So when you get on set, you're executing and you're just having fun more than anything. Mm. You got to enjoy what you're doing, right? So, so, and it's funny, we were having rehearsals. So Arnold Foslow, who plays a detective, you know, you know, he's a SAG actor and all of that. He's been trained in Hollywood and he's, you know, he's been doing this for years. So we come into rehearsals and then uh, uh, Dion Kutsia and, and Justin uh, straight up walk into there and they're like, um, you know, they, before we even rehearse, they say, you know, I just want to say that uh, it's my first time in 30 years of being in the film industry in South Africa, mm-hmm. where I am given more than three weeks to prepare as a character. Wow. And, and Arnold wow. was like, whoa, that's crazy. You know, I working for SAG in the US, it's normal. You know, you, you, you know the Brad Pitts of the world, the Leonardo DiCaprio's of the world, they'll have a script six months before they even get on set. That's why they get paid all those millions of dollars because they are the characters, right? So if we can begin to be able to respect actors, when they get on set, they are, if we can do that, even if you give them, and, and, I, and I, I have to give credit to Obrisa Kabi at the South African State Theater, mm-hmm. was able to kind of help me, you know, learn the process of, 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 of rehearsal when we did the stage play Galushi. At the South African State Theater. And I watched, I was like, well, well, I mean, if these guys are rehearsing for so long, why don't we take this and put it into cinema? Right? Yeah. And then we'll yeah. see what these actors can be able to do. And I mean, it's, it, and the results speak for themselves. Look at what Tabo, Michelle, and Stefan did, you know. And I'm so proud of them. I'm so, I'm, I mean, I hold them to my heart. 
I'm going to stop because I'm going to start crying. Let me stop right there. <laughs> It's it, it's the reverence that you put into the project and into the storytelling that then allowed them to put this reverence into it as performers and as characters. And that's what we feel as the audience is that we feel this tremendous respect, even for characters who make choices or are going through experiences that kind of go against what we think our morality is, you know? And I wanna come to Stefan and Michelle, you know, because your characters make some choices that are like, whoa, but, but you know, in your portrayal of the characters, at no point do we lose um, respect or lose a sense of, uh, understanding that this is a human being going through something extraordinarily difficult and doing the best that they can. So I want to commend you for that. And then ask you how you found, how did you, how did, what, what did you have to go through internally as a performer, as a person to be able to find that kind of compassion? Um, yeah, uh, I think one of the things that I, I, I always do is I, one will always try and find the humanity in the character. So with someone like Aldo, you find truth. And the truth is that he is a family man and mm. he has an incredible amount of love in him. So much mm. love, love for his family and love for his fellow MK soldiers and love for the cause that they are doing. And he's stuck between that duality of when does one outshine the other? Because you have to give them all the spotlight at some point. And then the others fall back. You know, sometimes it is your family that you are putting on, you know, forward and has the spotlight. And then sometimes it is the cause that has the spotlight. And then sure. I found, and working with Aldo and working with um, Mandla and, and the other actors as well is, is to find truth, you know, to find the truth. That's all you can ever do as an actor is just play the truth of the character, which, mm -hmm. you know, you want to remain truthful to, to the situations that they find themselves in. And, and then one thing is to always lead with compassion. Always remember these are people, these are real genuine people and we all are complex. And we, we make choices based on circumstance of information that we only have presented to us right in front of us. And, and that's what I always you know, think about when, when, when I was on set is like, what is his truth? What is right in front of him right now? Mm, I mean, it's, it's also, it's, it's a similar question even for you, Michelle, because I mean, passing, the idea of passing is 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 a it's a phenomenon that occurred wherever there was colonialism, wherever there was slavery, wherever there were these kind of racially ambiguous uh, identities that allowed for people to strip one identity off, put on another one, you know, for for power, for freedom, for mobility, for opportunities, for their families, for for all sorts of reasons. There's a beautiful movie on Netflix now called Passing, based on a, a play that was written in 1920, you know, um, and and I mean, your the, the transformation of your character, like that arc was just, it was phenomenal to watch. Um, how did you deal with the kind of the, the moral ambiguity of, of playing a, a woman who is, who's essentially, who's passing. I mean, it's, it's so layered because it's a woman with albinism, yeah. but who's passing, right. it's... Right, right, <laughs> right, right. It's, it's, it's very, very layered. And I think that, um, like, you know, it's, it's just a testament to the, the amount of work that went into just the whole movie and all the characters. Like, there are so many layers to each and every one of these characters that, you know, we can um, unlayer for hours and hours. But I think that, um, yeah, you know, as actors, I, you know, you're, you're taught to never judge your characters. You're taught to find the truth, as Stefan said, you know, find the complexity and, and, and the nuance. And I think that that was my number one uh, um, goal. But I think because, you know, like I said, the character is so close to me in the sense of that, you know, she's a, a, a black woman living with albinism, um, facing complexity you know so I needed to really dig very deep and find ways to um to deal with a lot of my own personal traumas and my own personal experiences in order to truly portray this uh to portray Rachel as authentically as possible because I think that um her specific or her given circumstances um are the reason why she's made uh particular choices such as 
feeling the need to pass, you know, and, and I don't think that it's something I can't imagine, you know, even doing research just about the concept of passing that anybody wanted to do that. It's not out of desire, you know, it's not out of desire that you want to, you know, uh, exile your blackness or whatever part of yourself it's out of survival you know you need to do this because the reality of uh systems like apartheid is that uh whiteness is celebrated whiteness is rewarded whiteness is given um access and if if you see that and you see that hmm I could possibly, you know, maneuver my way in this space, you know, why not? And and I mean, like you're saying, you see it even in the movie in passing way. Um, it's also just the treatment, you know, when you are maybe racially ambiguous, the treatment makes you go, my goodness. So, whoa, you can actually be treated like a human being. Who doesn't want that? But it's so sad because yeah. that comes at yeah. such a high, high, high cost, you know? And um, I think that the 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 complexity of everything that happens in the bank gives Rachel that kind of let me step back kind of moment you know where she goes wait I'm I'm this is a facade you know this is not Mm -hmm. necessarily something that I chose you might she might have thought that it's something she chose and something she truly wanted but now she's realizing that no, this came out of pain. This came out of trauma. And I need to begin to deal with that. I need to begin to uh, look into that, you know? And, and I think that she's, she's somebody who I, I think many of us can relate to because passing is so it's, I mean, you look at the world now, many of us are like Mm. passing for so many different things, you know? And and I think that so much we can relate to so yeah, I mean, we can, (laughs) I could go on and on and on and on, but I hope that answers the question. That is a point. Those are bars right there that you just said. A lot of us are passing for things that we are not. We are passing like we've got money when we don't have money. We are passing like you're passing for all sorts of different passing. Like you are not corrupt when you know you are corrupt. Passing like, yay, people are, we wear, we wear the mask. We really do. You know, it's just, it's just that your skin doesn't allow you to the questions that your skin poses are not hidden, but right. other people are hiding in all, we are hiding right. and maneuvering and shape-shifting in all sorts of ways. It's true. Right, right. exactly, exactly. Yo, oh, okay. Tabo. <laughs> you know, when you, when you lead any production, whether it's a, a theater production or whether it's a drama series, or I mean, you, you literally, you energetically, you're as a performer, you're carrying it on your back. You know, you're, 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 when you walk onto set and for those, for, for the duration of the shoot, it's like your body is kind of holding a lot of this as much as the director is, you are holding it. And I wanna commend you really for the way that you held this story from the beginning until the last drop, like respect, you know, just for the, the, the level of commitment and just, there were so many instances in the movie where your character has to kind of make decisions and change emotions like, like this, you know, on, on the, like the turn switch of a button. Um, How did you, how did you do that? How did you, how did you find um, those, those moments of transition? Um, And what, what did you do to prepare yourself psychologically, spiritually, for the responsibility of carrying this, like as uh, carrying this as a performer. Oh, well, uh, firstly, thank you uh, very much. Uh, regarding um, the transitions, look, I, I think the one thing I, I try to do is play human beings. I never play the job, I play the person. So I don't Beautiful. play a soldier, I play a Beautiful. person who happens to become a soldier. I never play a chef, I play a person who happens to be a chef that difference is quite huge. Because if I put in perspective that these are young 23, four, five, six year old men and women in a bank and who are uh, armed guerrilla fighters now, I assume that had the country they were born into been different, they'd be teachers or artists or accountants or lawyers or engineers. And so they are making decisions they were never prepared to make. They are in positions they should have never been in. And so I, I realized with the decision-making, especially with Calvin and everybody, like this is a kid making decisions that affect a country that will affect a country 
for probably the next thousand years, to be honest with you. And there's no way he's going to get it right all the time. There's no way he knows what he's doing. And, and I just played that. Mm. I, I, you know, um, it's, you know, I think Fanny Mugwena once told me that no villain knows they're a villain. And no, and, 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 you know, no protagonist knows they're a protagonist. And I try to, to play in that ignorance and it's a safe space for me. As for sort of uh, the part of being a lead and, and carrying story and, 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 and just uh, carrying the story spiritually and et cetera, I, I've never said this before. I think I'm, I'm built of strong stuff. Mm. I come from strong people, from good people, and I can carry a greater weight than this. And I think in Brahmandla and him, I, he carries so much on him mm. as well. He carries the... The, the, the stories, the, the minds, the spirits of, of millions upon millions of people. In a moment, he carries it. In his back, he carries it. In how he presents everything. When your director is telling you about a scene and he breaks out in tears and you haven't even started to play it, you mm. can see he's carrying the story in every morsel, in, in every sense, in, in, in his bones. And then I just feel like he's carried so much weight. Who am I not to carry more? You know, and I, 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 it doesn't feel, I do not feel a weight that weighs me down. I, do, I don't feel it's, it's a good weight to have. And I think we are made of sterner stuff than this. We can take so much more. We have taken more. That, that's why, to be honest with you, pandemics, uh, wars, we have survived everything as a people. We will survive more. And, uh, and if I have to carry a, a bit of a movie held together by incredible artists who carry it with me, you know, I think I'll be fine. I think I'll be fine. It's so beautiful to hear you speak. I'm looking at the comments um, from, from Facebook and from people who are watching. People are just saying, thank you. This is beautiful. Thank you for telling our stories so beautifully. Just watched the movie an hour ago, like emojis. Yeah. Like you've done a really wonderful job. Bramanda, before we close off, because I think we've got just a couple of minutes. Um, you know, this film asks many questions, um, many interesting questions intersecting questions about you know how thin the line between the oppressor and the oppressed is you know how even amongst the oppressor there are those who are oppressed it asks very interesting questions about the blurring of racial identities about the blurring of moral boundaries you know um it's 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 not one dimensional it is it is a, it's a it's a raucous action ride but it leaves you really questioning oneself very very deeply um and i guess the central question to the movie that i want to leave all of you with and maybe give you Budmanta, the first opportunity to answer is what is the price of freedom this question keeps coming back what's the price of freedom for you uh obviously the price of freedom is everything <laughs> You know, I, I put every ounce of who I am into, into, into Silverton Siege. It's the best work ever for me, right? And I, 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 I put everything and I, I can only thank uh, the support of my ancestors. I can only thank the support of my family and, you know, uh, the higher God, you know. So it's, it's, it's uh, the price of freedom is everything that we're doing today and that we're going through. Uh, and, and I think the price of freedom is relevant today more than ever, right? Mm. How do we pick up and say, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if we all just to pick up and say, stop it and we go to KwaZulu Natal and just go and help, right? Yeah. Well, wouldn't that be like something, you know, obviously we can't physically do it, but we can all send our meditation, our prayers and, uh, and, and support to, 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 to the to families of, of those that are, are going through this tragedy. But I, I don't know, I mean, what's the price? We, do we have uh, another hour? What's the price <laughs> of freedom? You know, <laughs> I don't think we do, but it, it, I think it's important that we immerse ourselves in being able to look to the left and to the right and above and below and align ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. in, the, in the creative industry, we like saying, you know, if the stars align, you know, then I will be shut up. You know, the stars have been aligned for the past 8 billion years. You need to align yourself, align yourself. We need to align ourselves more now than ever, right? We've got a comment from Nosi Mantada, who uh, is the daughter 
of the of daughter of, 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 of yes amazing yes yes uh, uh, yeah uh, she says um um again well done team applause 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 the feedback is incredible um sipo dupe says more love my brother i mean how does that feel like when you have the actual the, the living descendant of this, this 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 human whose story you're telling come back and say well done thank you thank you for honoring my family thank you thank you for this uh, listen okay like I said, I don't know how much time we got. We we uh, my process is we we do we do the, we write the script. It's there, and we you know everybody says, oh, it's a great script. Let's go and shoot. And I say, no, it's not good enough. We do a live script reading, right? So we did this with at the Rapid Lion Film Festival at Eric Eric Manny's Film Festival. So here we are. We organize. We get these actors in the in the theater. Uh, I think it's a Bunny Simon theater there, and then we reading the script. Right, open theater, some like I don't know, fifty people with mm-hmm. actors, and then at the end of the reading, a lady puts her hands up, says, "Hi, thank you so much for telling the story or going to tell the story." My father, Stephen Mafoko, was, yeah. and it was my first time meeting uh, No Simantata Chido, who who just sent that comment. It was like, whoa! So she's been a part of this process. Back in uh, uh, you know 2018, 19, then she took us to the graveside. Okay, wow. she took me to the graveside to 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 meet uh, the her father and and Hamfima Tela and, and so forth and and and, and Wilfred and, and and in driving into the into the cemetery, it was sunny as it was today. Driving into the cemetery, the clouds change. Yeah. It starts drizzling. I've got video. You know, I was like, you know what? I'm on Dom Nyama will never believe this. So I took out Ooh, my phone. Like, yeah. <laughs> like black people are not going to believe it because they're like, oh, there you go again with this stuff. So I took my camera out and I filmed the entire process. It was the sun as old. The clouds are changing. And then she and then to know see being such a beautiful angel, she says, Oh, it always happens when you come to the graveside. They are talking to us. They have they've blessed what you're doing already. Incredible. Wonderful. I can't, I can't say Affirmation. Yeah, Affirmation. Yeah, yeah, it's like, hey, we are, when you are aligned, you know. The hamba mo line. Oh, aligned. Africans aligned. Africans aligned. They will show you. Uh, they will show Africans you on the right track. Yes, yes. It's beautiful. It's know. beautiful. To 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 Stefan and to Tabo and to Michelle, we've got. I mean, I think we've got like two minutes left. Like just a minute each from each of you, please. What is the price of freedom? Let's start with you, Tabo. Okay. Wow. Uh, the price of freedom is is just the dignity. Is our dignity. We've, we've lost a lot of that as the family nucleus. The, the price of freedom is 350 rand that the youth are still lining up to go chase every Friday. And then, you know, that's, that's the price of freedom. And, and maybe one day we'll be priceless. And I hope to see it at that moment. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Stefan? Yeah, the, 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 the price of freedom for me is always, always asking the question, then turning it back on its head is like, what is freedom? And I think that's something that we can ask ourselves on Freedom Days. What does freedom mean for me? And it doesn't have to be this big thing that you are, you're fighting to save the world. It could be that freedom for me right now means having a clean room. Freedom for me means telling the people that are close to me that I love them. You know, mm-hmm. that could be what is your freedom. So, yeah, I think each character deals with freedom in the film and Brahmandla did a beautiful job of, of representing that. So I hope that, that those who watch the film can ask themselves, like, what does it mean for me? What does freedom mean right now? Thank you so much. That was beautiful. And Michelle. Yes. Oh, no, that was amazing. Uh, I think Stefan kind of stole my answer. But (laughs) um, yeah, I couldn't agree more with what everyone has said. And I think that, you know, freedom is immeasurable. And and, and it, it really... I think we need to understand that it, it it means more when we can all share in the freedom. It means more when we can all um, experience it. So, um, you know, as you ask yourself what freedom is, just, you know, and, and get to those answers, um, I, I pray that we can and 
we can all be a part of allowing others or giving others access to that freedom, sharing, being kinder to one another, uh, being allies, um, finding space to give, to help, you know, help in the KZN, give prayer. Um, you know, uh, if you see someone on the street that needs something, stop. You know, I think that we kind of uh, forget how how much has gone into our freedom that we're able to even do what we want to do today and I know we have a long way to go but um, I think we just need to pause for a second ask ourselves what is freedom and how can we allow or use our 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 freedom to to ensure that others have that freedom too thank you so can much I just say, can of I just course say, please do please you know the one of the most important things is to be able to teach young people to bury fear you know I've got oh, mm. I've got my son here He's been the one who's been like, this is Owame. <laughs> He's the one who's Owame. been like fidgeting and making sure that, you know, I'm able to align with the convergence of technology, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> we need those people, they're crucial. Yeah, there you you yeah. know, it's it, it just to bury fear. And 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 my, my, my brother, my sisters, you know, they'll tell you like how our parents just buried fear. We were allowed to do whatever it is that we wanted to, to be able to do. And, and it's so important that young people are empowered, you know? Yeah. At this age, I mean, forget this, while the baby's in the belly, yes. gosh, let's empower the babies, you know? I, yeah. Ancient Africans governed the spirit or the soul of a, of, 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 of a human from the womb to the tomb. That's why we could yeah. build temples that are still around 5,000 years today. You know what I mean? We we did that. Africans did that. You know, and we will continue doing it. We need to be able to empower because the future is them. Mm. Right, Owami? Yeah, that's true. Power to the people. Power to the people. <laughs> Power to the people. Power to the people, young uh, man. Uh, oh, I, I mean, we can't ask for a better ending than that. It's been my honor and my privilege and such a blessing to be able to spend today with you. I'm so grateful. Um, we're going to record this and package it and send it. Make sure that it stays up on YouTube and please share the links with your people. You know, I think this conversation is important, not just for now, but for posterity. Like the movie we've been discussing, The Silverton Siege, which has gone live on Netflix. You can watch it in 180 countries from today until until, until the story of the Silverton Trio adeptly played by the talent that we've seen here today, that we've listened to here today. And of course, I mean, the custodian of the story, Manza Gaise Dube Rao Lebohela, Stefan Erasmus, Tabo Ramizi, Michelle Musalakai. It has been my great pleasure to speak with you. Congratulations on such a beautiful project. I wish you everything of the best. I hope the world sees this and I, I just, I want people to be as blown away as I have been and as I've watched my peers in the industry and the people who've had the chance to see it thus far, you know, I want that same ripple effect to happen all over the world. We deserve to remember who we are. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ooh, one last comment from Nosi. We've got one last comment from Nosi. Yeah, she says, agreed, Manja. This story is important for the youth, yeah. We need this right now. I feel like in this moment in history, you know, with everything that's going on in this country and the way that we feel in this country about governance, about ourselves, about the economy, about everything, this is what we need, like fuel injected inspiration. Thank you so much for giving it to us. Peace and love. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of love to you, huh? Finding of right. love and respect. Thank you so much. Ciao. Bye. 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 Bye